You ready for this? <laughs> okay then. So first we're going to look again at Psalm 51. Psalm 51 again. <coughs> So this is obviously a psalm, this psalm 51 is obviously a psalm um, that uh, David had put together. Um, obviously we, we believe that all the word is superintended by the Holy Spirit. So although it was written um, by David, nevertheless um, it would have been inspired by the Holy Spirit. So this is after he had uh, committed sin with uh, Bathsheba of course and he fell from grace. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. So I wonder if there's anyone here <coughs> that has ever committed a sin, that has ever fallen from grace. <coughs> you may not have committed this sin, but we're not here to judge one another. We're not here to judge people in the scriptures. We're here to work out what God's saying to each one of us. So this is for those who have sinned and I would suggest that according to Romans all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So it's no good just saying well this is okay this is just David sort of spouting off and ranting about his own sins and trying to get right with God so I don't really need to take a lot of notice. No, no, this is, this is why it's in the Bible. This is why we have to look at this and go well this is also relevant to me and so this is what we're, we're doing. And we're, we're calling upon a God who is a loving God, a God who loves us. So we're coming to a God and asking his forgiveness. We're, we're coming to God and saying sorry, and we're recognizing that this is our God, this is our creator God. And, and we need God's mercy, because without God's mercy we're done for. And so we know that this God is God of loving kindness. And he has tender mercies. Um, and one of the things that I did notice in Scripture, that it says um, twice that I require mercy, not sacrifice. This is something in the New Testament you'll find that God requires mercy and not sacrifice. So this is his heart. This is his father heart. And every father has this heart for their children if they really are, you know, someone who has a heart after God. That's, that will be their heart. This is where the loving leadership comes in. This is where the husband and the father has a loving leadership because they have the heart of the father. And that heart of the father is not to criticize, condemn and complain and put down and be a dictator. This is a loving leader. <coughs> this is someone who is um, a father under our father in heaven and has the same kind of heart. And what they said about David is that he had a heart after God. Now even though he had a heart after God, he nevertheless sinned. And this is unfortunate, but this is a fact of life. So it says here, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. So he's asking God to literally wipe his slate clean. He's saying, in effect, God, you know that I really want to serve you. You know that I love you. You know that you know, I want to do everything for you, but my flesh life took over. My, the lusts of the flesh took over. This is what happened to me. And, you know, take this sin away, you know, blot it out, get rid of it, destroy it. It needs to be taken away completely. It says verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And that's what we say when we come to the lavabo before we come to the Eucharist is we say, you know, Lord, wash away my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. This is something that we tend to do before we come to the altar as clergy this is something that we do so this is where it comes from so you understand what we're doing when we say that we're saying 
We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And even as believers, we can fall into sin. We can be ignorant sometimes that we even have sinned and not realize it. You know, sometimes we, um, we are oblivious sometimes of even what we're doing. We act unconsciously sometimes and do things and, and, and don't even realize. That's why, that's why the early church fathers, I think it was Augustine, said, you know, Lord, I have faith increase my faith so there's a sense in which you know we have a portion of God in us we have been redeemed we have been forgiven we have been you know sanctified by God at the same time the old man is still in there and sometimes you know we're not aware even sometimes that he comes out and we sin in 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 ways that we probably weren't aware of and so we're asking God to, to cleanse us again. Verse 3 says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. So we're looking often, you know, in the Old Testament especially, they were looking, because they came under the law, they're always looking at the fact that they are sinning. And they're always reminding one another, they're always telling one another when they have sinned. So there is a kind of judgmental thing that starts to creep in there, where we are our brother's keeper. And if you think that someone's breaking the law, it's your duty to remind them that you're breaking the law of God. And that was the kind of attitude that they, they grew up with and developed. And so David is saying, my sin is always before me. In other words, I'm very aware of the times when I fall short of the glory of God in my life. I'm very aware of that. And I acknowledge those things. Verse 4 says, And against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. So he's obviously coming before Nathan the prophet, and Nathan is speaking the word of God. Thus says the, thus says the, the Lord. You know, he's speaking directly to him, and he's told him of these sins that he's committed against the Lord. You know, notice that quite often, although when we hurt other people and when we do things wrong, the, the most important thing is, is that we have sinned against the Lord. So, you know, it, we often feel that we have, our consciences are seared when we, when we upset people, when we do something wrong against a person and we might feel really guilty because we've done something wrong and it's affected someone else. And unfortunately, sin does affect all sorts of things. And there are consequences of sin. And so we have to understand that in, in modern times, when we sin, when we have done something wrong against God, but specifically the other six commandments were all about sinning against your neighbor. And so when we've done something wrong against someone else, and we have been unmerciful. We have been uh, unforgiving. We have done something wrong to them, or they've done something wrong to us, and we have not exercised the heart of God and been merciful and been forgiving. This is the heart of God. This is the heart of the believer, to be merciful and forgiving as, as our Father in heaven. And so what happens is that we are sinning against God, even though we are not actually sinning against someone else in, in the sense we're doing something to hurt them consciously. When we sin unconsciously, that's still a sin. So if you think, well, I have every right because I've been hurt, I have every right to be, uh, you know, to be angry with this person, to to uh, want retribution from this person, to not forgive this person, to hold them to ransom because they have upset me. This is one of those areas where we understand that that is possibly something you may be doing unconsciously because you may have not realized the brevity of what you do when you hold someone as ransom. When you, when you do not forgive someone when you're not merciful, when you're not a merciful servant, how can you expect God to be merciful to you? Because we all sin. And so this is something really, really important. And this is why we can't 
harbour sin in our hearts. This is what we call harbouring sin in your hearts when you're unforgiving, when you don't exercise mercy towards others. You're harbouring sin in your heart and guess who you're singing against? Well, you're sinning against your neighbour by harbouring harboring that sin in your hearts, whether you realise it or not. But the most important thing is that you are offending God because he is our father. And so he's the father of everyone. And so when we're harbouring sin against another human being, that hurts God's heart. That upsets God. That grieves the Holy Spirit who has come to make his home with you in your temple that your temple is not clean, that you are not forgiving, that you're not merciful, you don't have the mind of Christ, you're not forgiving like God has called you to, it's really important. And we're sinning against the God who created us. So we have to really you know, press this one home, because many people think, well, it's okay, you know, I'm not, you know, I have every right, you know, this self-righteousness comes in. I have every right, you know, I'm not going to do that. Okay, I know that God's word says I should forgive people, but no, I'm not going to forgive that person or this person because they are just rubbish, you know, I don't like these people or they're no good or what. Well, that's harboring sin in your heart. And that is what we call a bitter root of resentment. And what builds out of that, that is anger that is turned inside that you're, you're actually almost like taking poison expecting someone else to die. And so it affects you, and it affects you in your body, it affects you physically. And that forgiveness is, is for you, it's not for the other person. It's so that you actually have a clean heart, so that you're not harbouring the sin. And so it may seem that I'm kind of you know, going on one here, but this is so important because so many people that I know, so many people that I've met that are Christians, don't understand this. They really don't think that this is an issue. And as I say, the longer you become a Christian, the more you become aware, as David, my sin is always before me. So you begin to deal with your sins in these unconscious kind of areas, or these areas where you're not quite so sure, it's not so clear for you. And when we come to this, it's important for me as a minister to preach this and let people know that this is something that for many people they're ignorant of. They don't realize what they're doing. That they, they are truly sinning against Almighty God. And David knew this. He says in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me know to know wisdom. So there is a sense in which we have all been brought forth in iniquity. What does he mean by that? So what are you saying then? You're saying that my mum was sinning when she had me? You're saying that my dad was sinning when he had me because they were married? How can that be? How does that work? So what, sex is sin then? Having babies is sin? God told us to go forth and multiply. How does that work? Something's not right there. Something's not working. So in iniquity, I was brought forth. And in sin my mother conceived me. So what did we have in terms of sin? Well, we had inherent sin, didn't we? We had the sin of Adam. That's where it comes from. There wasn't anything wrong with the sexuality and you know, the fact that they were making love and having babies. That wasn't wrong. That's right. It's quite accurate. And of course, you know, we're told that this is something that is honouring to God. God has told us to you know, go forth and multiply and so this is something that, that we should be doing. This is something we, we need to perpetuate the generations and to bring more people along to learn the ways of God and to worship God. So there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but it says, Behold, you desire truth in inward parts. So what he's saying is, look, I have inherent sin. I have that part of me, as Paul talks about, the old man, I have that part of me that is biased towards sin. Every one of us has a bias towards sin because of that inherent sin we have. Now that bias towards sin and that sin from Adam doesn't condemn us before God. But it causes us to sin because it's our DNA. It's in our DNA to be sinners. And that's why the, the law was given 
because people needed to be conscious of their sins. Before the law, they weren't conscious of their sins. And so the law was given through Moses so that we would be conscious of the fact that we couldn't keep to God's standards, that we all have this sinful nature. He's talking about the sinful nature, you see. And therefore, because he had this sinful nature, it's pretty obvious that something was going to go wrong at some point. And we have to understand that's why God initiated the priesthood. That's why God initiated the sacrifices. Because obviously everyone would be sinning under that law. God knew that. God understood that. That nobody's perfect. Not one. Everyone would be sinning. Wow. So the sacrifices were there because without the shedding of blood there's no remission of the sins. God can't remit the sins even for a year unless there's a, a blood sacrifice. But when there was a blood sacrifice what happened is that your sins were remitted for a year. Or when you actually committed a sin yourself you actually went and gave a sacrifice and that was it until the priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year and offered a sacrifice for the whole nation that you lived in as the people of God, all circumcised people of God, all people that were called by his name. But it was only a temporary thing. Your sins were not forgiven permanently under the old law. That was the other problem with the law. It didn't take your sins away permanently. Because it was a covenant that says if you sin, you're going to be cursed. And if you do what I'm telling you, if you're obedient, you'll be blessed. But under the old system of the law, once you gave a sacrifice, that was, it, wasn't done for, it wasn't a done deal forever. It was only taking care of that for the moment. And then once a year, for a year, you wouldn't be judged for your sins because the, the high priest would be given sacrifice on your behalf. For a year. And hoping that God would hold on to his part of the covenant agreement. His agreement that was actually always instituted with blood. The blood covenant was there originally. And then each time you were, your sins were remitted, not permanently, but were remitted for the time being, it was, it was only for a for a time and therefore you're still under the judgment of God and God obviously judged the people quite often but the, so the whole point of the law and the sacrifices was to point forward to some some time in the future because people would realize that they couldn't appease God permanently there was something not quite right with this system in that it didn't give complete permanent remission of sins. It did not take them away permanently. And so David says, my sins are always before me. So there was no, there was no knowledge of eternal life. There was no knowledge of being with God. You just, it was just this life and if you didn't if you didn't come and offer a sacrifice when you sinned and you were aware of your sin and your conscience told you a sin, guess what? You knew you were going to come under the judgment of God under this old system. And this is the problem with the law. Nobody could keep it and so everyone came under judgment and these sacrifices were only there like a sticky plaster in a way to kind of help you to feel a bit better and, and know that you're being... You, that God's being merciful to you, that you've done what you, what you are supposed to do. And then we come to this verse 7. It says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Crying out. And this is the problem when you haven't got Christ in your life. When you haven't understood how Christ takes away your sins permanently and gives you eternal life and your soul is redeemed, you're going to always be crying out to God and saying to God, 
you know, please don't, don't consider my sins. Please don't look at what I've done. You know, blot it out. You know, please don't remember it. Please, please forgive me. Please, please, please. And not really knowing fully that it's been dealt with completely. It hasn't been dealt with completely. Because someday you're going to face God in judgment. And they knew that. And sometimes God is going to come in judgment to you because that was only a temporary fix. Verse nine says, uh, verse ten says, "Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your holy spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit." So this is what he asked God for to give him a clean heart. And obviously, as far as we know, from then on, you know, he, he did have a clean heart. He had a heart after God right from the very beginning. He was someone who loved God and would sing God's praises. But nevertheless, inherent sin dragged him down and caused him to sin. Unfortunately, as King thought he could get away with stuff, and, you know, fame, sometimes power corrupts. And, and that's what happens, and people sometimes forget when we're being successful when David was king before he was king he was he was relying on God for everything but when he became king he started to get a little bit arrogant he started to to forget what God wanted in his life and and obviously the pull to the the old man the the, the lusts of the flesh became strong and you know he, he kind of took God for granted that God was just going to be there. And then when Nathan came and, and confronted him, it was a different story. Suddenly he realized, and suddenly he understood that God was not pleased, which he would know already, but, but just ignored it. And that's what happens with these kind of sins. And so he's asking God to create in him a clean heart now um, and renew a steadfast spirit. In other words, He's actually asking God to say, you know, keep me stable in my walk with you. You know, give me a steadfast spirit. I don't want a spirit that's here today and gone tomorrow. I need something in me that's going to hold me fast, that's going to keep me strong in the Lord. And I, for, I need to start off by emptying my bin and having a clean heart. I need to clean house. So this is called Repentance. Through faith, it's repentance. We clean house. We empty our bin. You know? And so this is what he's asking for. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. That would be the most awful thing, to be out of God's presence, out of God's will, and not know the hand of God on your life. This, is, this would be catastrophic. Bearing in mind, this is the same David that was chosen above all these great, big, you know, healthy, strong men, and he was a little, a little shepherd boy, and he was chosen, and God was with him, and, and he knew God was with him in the desert, in the wilderness, when he was killing lions and bears, and then he came against Goliath, and he knew that God was with him. And so the idea that God would cast me away from your presence, you know, do you know God's with you? Have you, have you been through trials and tribulations and tested the Lord and realized and tasted the Lord is good and realized that God is merciful, that God is gracious, that God loves you, that God really is your Father who looks after you? Have you really understood that part about God? Because maybe you haven't yet. Maybe you're a young Christian that hasn't come through that. Maybe your faith has not been tested yet. You know, the test is when you come up against something that you think there's no way that I can do this, there's no way I can get through this, I don't know where I'm going to get the finances, I don't know where I'm going to get the resources, I don't know how I'm going to fight this evil, I don't know how I'm going to get through this day, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this situation that I'm stuck in. And you trust God for it, and in faith believe God that He is going to intervene. That's a test. And it's not God's test, it's not testing God, you're testing God in yourself, but it's not really testing the Lord, it's testing you. And that is how, in faith, we grow. 
Faith is like a muscle, you know, you have to exercise faith. So when you're in that awful position, when you're in that place between a rock and a hard place, you know, this is the time when you trust God for your future, the time when you trust God for your resources, and God intervenes, and you go, wow, yes, thank you, God. And so you learn a little bit about having faith. You realize that God is there for you, that God is, has got your back. And that starts to change you. And so you begin to build your faith when you are tested. And of course, the more you act in faith, the more you step out in faith and trust God, the more, the stronger the things are going to come for you to overcome in God through faith. You know? It's to build you up. It's to get you to a better place in God. It's to understand how you need to follow God. It's very, really important. And so, David says, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So he felt that God's Spirit was with him, that his Holy Spirit was there, guiding him and leading him. And therefore, in his prayers, when he was talking to God, when he was walking about in his daily life, then obviously he would understand that God was with him. The Holy Spirit was with him. And he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Well, what happens the minute we sin, something goes wrong. There's something that happens to every believer the minute they sin and they are conscious of the sin, when they become conscious of the sin, what happens? It takes away the joy. It takes away the joy of your salvation. It takes away the feeling of peace and happiness. That wellspring of joy that's in your heart that you have when you're in the will of God, when you're sinning against God, when you're harboring sin in your heart, that joy goes. You're not happy. You think you are. You even convince you are. You convince yourself sometimes, oh, I'm, I'm okay, I'm happy, yeah, I'm following God, I'm all right. And all the time you're harboring sin in your heart, you're going to come to the Eucharist and you are going to feel not right. You're just not going to feel good about yourself. You're not going to feel comfortable. You're going to feel a bit uncomfortable. The minute you start to face up with God, this is what happens. When God shines a light on your sin, and if we are here today, and I'm preaching a message to you and talking about sin, and if God shines a light on that sin that you are having in your heart, you're not going to feel comfortable. You're going to resent, probably, me saying it. You're going to resent the word. And you are not going to feel comfortable, unless you change it. It's a bit like the, the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, and Jesus said, told him what to do, and he went away sad, because Jesus had told him what he needed to do to get into the kingdom of God, and he didn't want to do it. And that's when people feel uncomfortable, and then they go out miserable, and they say, I don't like that church. <laughs> I don't like that pastor. I don't like this, this pastor's always hit me over the head, with, uh, making me feel bad. Well, no. We're just saying what the Word says, and it's up to you to argue with God about that, and, and, and work it out. But God is actually saying, if you want to have peace and joy in your heart, then you need to be obedient. And if you're not, as David says to us, here, he shows us very clearly that he, he wants to keep the Holy Spirit happy. He doesn't want to grieve the Holy Spirit in him. He doesn't want his spirit, the Holy Spirit to leave him. And he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Because we know that God is generous. That we, we can't even outgive God. God is so generous. And he's so full of mercy. If we come to him and repent... We don't need to carry on feeling uncomfortable. What we need to do is repent. It's so simple. But we may not want to repent. We may want to hang on to what we've got. We may decide that we know better than God and we want to carry on with what we're feeling. But it's not going to help us. It's going to end in tears. It's not going to be good. There's not going to be a joy there. And it says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. So what that's saying is that when I actually act upon your word, 
And when I'm feeling uncomfortable and I don't want to do the things that you asked me to do, when I actually do it and you restore my joy of salvation and you remind me that you are still with me and that you blot out my transgressions and you are merciful to me and you restore me back to where I was before because I've repented, then I can tell other people and glorify you and say how wonderful God is because look what he's done for me. I am merely a sinner. Look what he's done in my life. Unless we hold on to ourselves thinking that we are great and God's just there as a kind of bolt on. And that's not the way God expects us to be. But when we realize that without God we're nothing. Without God we are bankrupt spiritually. We have nothing to offer. Nothing to offer anyone. We may be influential. We may be very persuasive. We may be someone who's very attractive. We may be someone that people admire. We may have a charism about us that people are just, you know, drawn to. But that doesn't make us spiritual. That doesn't say that we have a heart after God and that God is restoring us and that we have a peace and joy that comes from God. And what happens if we carry on with that, then it ends up nowhere because eventually we lose those things because God allows them to just drain away. We need to rely on God. And so therefore, God in his generous spirit upholds us and then we can teach others what God has done for us. And that's amazing. You know, there's nothing better than a great witness of someone being stuck in sin and having all sorts of problems with sin in their lives and coming to God and becoming an overcomer and becoming more than a conqueror in Christ. Becoming someone renewed in the Spirit. By someone becoming born again and elevated to become a saint in the kingdom. Nothing better is that. For, as a witness to other people outside who are not believers. That's, mm, that's like gold because it really draws people to God because they realize that we've all sinned and everyone has problems. Let's just turn to Jeremiah very quickly. <coughs> this is Jeremiah 31 and from verse 31 to 34 says here, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Wow, that's a relief. Because the old covenant, well, it worked for God to bring people to an understanding of their transgressions. It brought people to an understanding that they're not perfect, that nobody can stand before God. It brought a healthy fear and respect of God. And now we have something else. God has, has instituted something else for us. He's, he's brought something else about. He says, I will make a new covenant. Why? Well, verse 32, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So this law was a covenant, the law of Moses, the covenant, the Ten Commandments, that was a covenant that God made with them. And in Deuteronomy, it talks about, you know, blessings and curses. If you kept the law, you'd be blessed. And if you broke the law, you'd be cursed. This is a blood covenant that was, that was created. And the blood covenant was in circumcision and also in the sacrifices of the, the bulls and goats and everything else. But now God is telling him, the people through Jeremiah, that he's going to create a new covenant that the old one they broke just to remind them that they couldn't keep the law that they weren't perfect that they couldn't just call themselves the people of God and think that was okay just to carry on the way they were something needed to change and God was going to bring something forth that was going to change things and change them eternally <laughs> verse 33 says but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so when we, we, we lift up the word on, on Sundays and we say, uh, you know, Lord, God speak to my mind, God be in my heart, God be on my lips, let your grace show in my life. This is what we're talking about. 
that God, you know, we are going to be God's people and he's going to be our God. It's, it's a commitment, it's a covenant. It's a new covenant through the blood of Christ. But that's what he's talking about here. Verse 34, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. In other words, no, there's no need anymore to say, Don't forget the law. You know? You've just, I just see you break the law. You know, you need to make, realize that God's not going to be happy. They won't need to do that. They won't need to go to the scribes. They won't need to go to those uh, sitting in judgment and say, you know, this has happened. You know, what do we do now? Because every man will know the law. Whereas in those days they had so many laws that they really had to go to the scribes and the judges to actually give them some sort of verdict as to what the situation was and who had sinned in what situation. And then they would go and offer sacrifices. And that's how it worked. They would go to the priest and say to the priest, the Levites, they would say to them what had happened and they would give them judgment and say what they had to bring as a sacrifice. And of course, like anything else, it became corrupt and they, they would probably get things for themselves out of that. And that's how it worked. They said, For they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. So it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for one day, or 50 years. It doesn't matter how spiritual you think you might be or other people might think you are. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. Once we have the Word of God and we begin to understand the Word of God, then it's written in our hearts. It's written in our minds. It's already on our lips because we have, we have studied the Word of God. We have come to the Word of God and that God is actually speaking to us. We don't need prophets anymore because we've got it all. The word is sufficient. It's enough to equip us as ministers too. We have the word of God and that's amazing. It says, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So under this new covenant, it's a different covenant. They're not going to have remission of sins for a period of time. And the high priest is not going to have to go in there every year to bring this remission to the people of God. No. This, I will forgive their iniquity. Forgive means that I shall remember them no more. And their sin I will remember no more, you see. That's what he's saying. Not until the next time the high priest comes in when I have to accept his sacrifice for everyone's sins. This is, I'm not going to need to do that anymore. There's a new covenant coming. Wow. Amazing. This is a new covenant. This is not the old covenant anymore. So when we start acting like we're under the old covenant, we need to, we need to do a step change and find out what's going on here. Why are we still under the old covenant when we have a new covenant? Why do we need to keep referring back to this old covenant and keep worrying about it. What we need to do is get right with God and make sure we're under the new covenant. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 5 says, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, Melchizedek was a, was a great king. And he was someone that Abraham met. And he was generous to Abraham. And Abraham even paid him tithes. Because he was a righteous king. He was very righteous. And this king, we know, was someone who was going to continue his reign. And there would be no, no ending of that. That was what happened. And so... Christ is made a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek that he didn't die. That he was taken. And Christ is also never going to die. He, he died once for us all, but his resurrection meant that he's a priest forever. That he became our high priest. Not to go in once a year to the Holy of Holies, when he was on the cross, what happened to the curtain in the temple? 
when he was on the cross and he said, it is finished, the temple curtain was torn, opened, the way of the Holy of Holies that only the high priest could go into once a year, that temple curtain of the Holy of Holies was torn apart, which meant that we could now go into the Holy of Holies because you couldn't go into the Holy of Holies unless you had, you know, really been sanctified and set apart and all the ceremonial stuff and you were the high priest and you'd definitely been called by God and you had done everything you needed to do and they even then they still tied a rope around your ankle when you went in in case you died in there and they had to pull you out because no one's going to go in there after you into the Holy of Holies because you know before the mercy seat of God and God's presence is there you get burned up you'd be on the spot you know when they touched the, the Ark of the Covenant, they fell down dead. Well, in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, which is the mercy seat of God, and God would presence himself there. And so the high priest would go in once a year to make atonement for the people of God, for the Israelites, for the Jewish people. That's what would happen. But when Christ came under this new covenant, this is what he's talking about here, something changed. He was going to be a priest forever. And guess what? He has also opened the way that we become a royal priesthood. So you can enter the Holy of Holies. Wow. Isn't that amazing? You can now enter the Holy of Holies so we can come boldly before the throne of God. That's what we're talking about. Of course we have reverence and fear of what God could do. But we have God as a Father now. Not as a policeman, he's our father. And we know he is merciful and tender and forgiving. And we know that through the blood of Christ we are forgiven, that we are redeemed, that we no longer have to worry that God has cleansed us through the blood of Christ. And so it's verse 7, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And verse 7 says, who in the days of his flesh when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his hot godly fear. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Christ is praying and he's crying to God and saying, if it's possible, take this away from me. I don't really want to go there. It really is going to be terrible. It's going to be awful. Not only is it going to be horrific in terms of I know that I'm going to suffer death and punishment I'm going to be taken on the sins of other people which is so unjust and so wrong and I'm going to take on their sins and the weight of their sins is killing me. And, and I'm going to have to pay the price and I know that that means that you're, I'm going to have to feel your wrath upon me and I'm your son and I, f I have fear of your wrath. I have a godly fear. And it says, verse 8, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So even in that, he was made complete, even in his sufferings, that he could identify with us and know that what we should have got, he got. So there's nothing that we have suffered that he hasn't suffered. There's nothing that we have been through spiritually that he hasn't been through. That's the point. He was obedient even unto death. And verse 9 says, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So in his sufferings, get this, this is important, even in his sufferings, he became perfected. So if you're suffering for Christ, if you're suffering for the sake of the gospel, if you're being persecuted for Christ, if you are having to pay the price of your sin because you're being disciplined in some way as a son or daughter, if you're being in a place of suffering, if you're there in that suffering place and things are not going the way you expect them to like David after he had sinned maybe you haven't come through yet maybe you haven't had that breakthrough into normal life under God and being with God 
and feeling God in your life. Maybe you're still in that suffering. Just remember that Christ was perfected through that suffering in the same way that we also come to maturity in Christ. We are not perfect until we get to the other side of glory, but we are still perfected on the way. We are a work in progress. We are sanctified. Yeah? We are set apart for God. And so there is a sense in which we are being refined by the fire. God is moulding us. So when we hold on to sin and we harbour sin, God is not pleased and we can come under discipline for that. And maybe we think we should be getting something or getting somewhere or doing something and maybe God is saying something to us, no, you can't move from that because you still haven't dealt with this. I'm not going to give you this next step until you've dealt with this step. I'm not going to take you and elevate you higher until you deal with what's in front of you that you're being disobedient in and you need to do something about that or suffer the consequences. I still love you, but I'm disciplining you like a son or daughter and I'm saying, okay, I want to give you all this, but unless you deal with that and are obedient, you can't have it. So you are blessed because you're still alive. You're blessed because you're still able to work and eat and uh, all the things that you you have shelter and clothing but you may not get to the next stage that you would like to see yourself at. You may not get to the point where I'm calling you to something greater but you need to deal with this first. And so there is a sense in which you will get your breakthrough when you deal with this first when you put God first in your life. That's what he's saying here. You're going to be perfected. As Christ became perfected and became the author of eternal salvation because he was a high priest forever and that meant he could give us remission of sins forever and make us perfect to redeem our soul from hell and take it to heaven because he is our high priest that brings us into heaven before the throne of God that we might be forgiven eternally. The sins are dealt with eternally that God chooses never to remember your sins. Past, present and future. Amen. Number 10, he call, it says, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, which is forever. The high priest forever. Let's just go to the Gospel very quickly. This is John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 20 to 33. Are you with me today? Are you, are you in this place? Are you really actually listening to what God is saying to you? Amen. Amen. Let me hear an amen then. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay, so we're going to John chapter 12, verse 20 to 33. Now there was a certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. And then came, they came to Philip, who was, with, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. <gasps> well, Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So something's going to happen now. The Son of Man's going to be glorified. Well, we're coming up in this time of Lent, coming up to Easter time, when we see the crucifixion of Christ, and everything seems to go wrong, and he's saying to his disciples, the hour has come for me to be glorified. So, there is a sense in which Everyone around them at that time, the Jews, the Romans, even his disciples doubted anything good was going to happen once they realized he was with the Sanhedrin and, and, and with the Romans at that time, with Pilate. They, 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 they couldn't see anything good coming from this. So this is what was going on. This is what he was talking about, about being glorified. He was going to this awful death. 
And so he's saying, I'm going to be glorified. The Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So he's talking about his death, but also about his resurrection. That when you're farming, you sow a seed, and that it's died, that this is, it's dead. It's a lifeless thing. But when you put it into the ground, and you water it, and it has sunlight, it begins to germinate and it starts to grow. And not only does it come up with one seed, but it comes up with many seeds. So he's prophetically speaking in a prophetic, practical way, in a spiritual way, a parable, saying, this is what's going to happen to me. I'm going to die, but then I'm going to raise, and I'm going to be much more, much bigger, and there's going to be much more fruit coming when I am raised. And this is what he's telling them. Verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So he's saying, look, if you want to be like me, you're going to have to do the same. You're going to have to be prepared to lose your life. What do you mean? So we, we've got to die? He's talking about losing your life and your agenda and your ways of life. And the old man, the way the old man influences you, your, your lusts of the flesh, your desires for this life, your love for this life, unless you're prepared to, to die to yourself, that's what he's talking about, to the self. To the false self, to who you, your ego, your agendas, everything about you needs to die. You need to humble yourself and be prepared to die to yourself. To stop being self-righteous. To stop being self-conscious and self-aware and all those things that put you first. You need to die to all that. Die to the old man. Die to the ways of Egypt. Because now... If you want to find your life, if you want to find a life with God, if you want to be a child of God and a child of the Father in heaven, then you've got to be prepared to let go of this life. Just like a seed, you've got to become dead to this life so that you can live again. So it's not just dying in the, in the physical sense of dying, it's dying to yourself psychologically, dying to yourself spiritually, not thinking anything of yourself, realizing that under the law you're nothing, nothing before God, except you are loved by God, but you have got nothing to offer God in return as an unbeliever who is sinning. And even as a believer, if you're holding on to your old life and your old beliefs and your old ways and all the things that you think are right according to you, in your own self-righteousness, that is not going to serve you well. That will not go down well. God will not be pleased with that. And he wants you to die to self. This is what he's saying today. And guess what? He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So you, you, your life, your new life will be eternal. Verse 26, If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honour. So we're called to a life of service then. We're called to a life of following him. And we need to learn how to follow him by reading his word. And we need to get the mind of Christ. We need to follow him and serve him. That means being obedient to him. Having a heart after God. Obeying the Father as Jesus obeyed the Father. Verse 27, now my soul is troubled, he says. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. So he's saying, look, I know I'm going to suffer for your sakes. I know I'm going to suffer for the, the Father's business. I'm going to suffer for serving the Father. So what am I going to say? Well, just take it away from me. How can I do that? Because 
I have a purpose in God. How can I do that? How can I say to God, take this away from me? I don't want this bit now. <laughs> I don't like this bit. It's a bit painful. Take it away. I, I, I don't want to go through this fire. Please quench the flames. Please don't make me go this way. Please don't make me go into this place. Please don't ask me to serve you and get rid of things that I don't want to get rid of. Don't ask me to serve you and do things that I didn't want to do. Don't ask me to serve you and learn grace and mercy and forgiveness and humbleness of heart. Don't ask me to do that. But for this purpose I was, I was brought to God, I was called to God. Jesus said, this is my purpose for being here, to reconcile you back to God. And how can I do that unless I go to the cross? And how can you gain your life unless you're prepared to lose it and follow me? You can't. This is what he's saying to us. And so he says, Father, glorify your name. In other words, your will be done. I know that this is my purpose. I have to suck it up and get on with it. This is what he's called me to. And so he says, then, Father, glorify your name. So he's saying, I'm, this is now my hour to be glorified. Glorify your name, Father, in me. And that's what you should be saying. That's what we should all be saying to Father. We should be saying to the Father, Father, glorify your name in my life. When I get with your purpose and I start to get rid of my purpose and my agenda and I start to lose my life for your sake, Father, I'm saying glorify yourself in me. I give you all the glory. Hallelujah. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So when he's talking to you, he's already glorified his name in you by calling you to change, by calling you to a new life, by calling you out of darkness and he's given you light. He's already glorified himself in you by showing you the light of the gospel. What are you going to do with it? But he says, I will glorify it again. So he's not just calling you out, he's also calling you that he's going to glorify himself in you. The same as he did with Jesus. This is what we see here. Verse 29, Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered and others said, an angel has spoken to him. So this was a very dramatic entrance of the Father on the life of Christ at the time when he's talking to these disciples. And Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. So this voice came for a purpose. It came to say, this is my son. And what he's saying to you is absolutely correct. Don't dismiss what I'm saying to you. Don't ignore the word that you're hearing right now because this came for your benefit didn't come for me didn't come for Christ he says it didn't come for me it came for you it came for his disciples and it comes for you that's what he's saying verse 31 says now is the judgment of this world now the ruler of this world will be cast out and I if I am lifted up from the earth will draw all peoples to myself so he's showing how <coughs> excuse me so he's showing how he's going to be lifted up like Moses lifted up the snake in the desert like Christ will be lifted up on the cross of of Calvary he showed that he is going to be lifted up and that that is how he's going to be glorified he's going to be glorified in the cross so we glorify in the cross of Christ so when people say it's a horrific death, you shouldn't have the Christ. Uh, Christ as a symbol is terrible. That's why Christians have the cross as a symbol. Because it glorifies Christ. It was a harsh death. It was a horrible, cruel piece of wood that he was nailed to. But it glorified him. He who was perfect took our sins away on that cross. That glorifies the Father. That glorifies the Son. And it glorifies the Holy Spirit in us when we recognize that. Amazing. And that's how it's going to be. And it shows. And at that point, he will draw all people to.
to himself. This is, this is how it's going to be. This is, this is the whole point for us. This, he said, signifying by what death he would die. It was, it was holy for us. It was completely for us. And if you, if you take anything away from what we've said today, the most important thing to understand is what Christ has achieved for you. And so whatever you're going through, whatever trials or tribulations, whatever things you think are unfair, are unjust, whatever things you, you believe you shouldn't have to go through, you're going through them for his sake. You're going through them for your own sake so that you actually learn and grow and develop in Christ, so that you become refined through the fire, so that you become what he wants you to become rather than what you thought you should be. So he's calling you to something. He's calling you to a new life. And he will give you a new life if you're prepared to give up your old life. If you're prepared to just get, you know, allow yourself to just get rid of what was going on in your life and just start a new life and follow Christ, he will honor it. And he will give you a new life. Something that you probably never imagined is going to take you places you never ever thought you'd be. He's going to give you a purpose that you always missed. That when you feel that everything is meaningless, outside of Christ, everything is meaningless. But in Christ, suddenly you have a purpose. There is a plan and purpose for your life that is hidden in Christ. That the Father has this plan for you. But it's hidden in Christ. Until you get to know Christ, it's not revealed. It's only when you give up your old life and follow Christ and, and expect that he is going to show you something new and he's going to bring a sense of purpose to you. Only then are you truly living in this world without being in the world and following the world. You're actually living in the world but you're following Christ. So you're now a citizen of heaven and you're following the plan that God has for you. And it was there from conception. It was there before you were even conceived. It was already there. The plan was there. Christ had already paid the price for you. And the Father just wants you to recognize his Son and obey his Son and follow him. And that's what we're all about now, is to follow Christ. Amen? Amen.